Good afternoon, this is Brandon with Train by Techs. Today we've got a BMW here. The customer brought it to us with a complaint of uh, runs rough intermittently when he's driving it. Now, I took the car on extended road test and I feel what I would describe as an intermittent, like a fish bite type misfire. Uh, we've scanned the car for DTCs and there's no really any supportive evidence on which cylinder seems to be at fault. So we're going to have to go about proving out what's wrong with this car another way. Um, if you stick with me throughout this case study, I'm going to demonstrate some techniques you can use to help you get to the bottom of problems without taking cars apart and investing any more time than you have to. And I also want to take the opportunity to boast some significant characteristics my ATS eScope Elite has that not many other scopes do. Here's the device over here. We're going to be carrying you through this case study on how I went about diagnosing this misfire on this inline six cylinder BMW engine. So let's get on with this issue. So we took the opportunity with this BMW to remove some covers from underneath the hood to gain access to the wires that we need to on this vehicle. Now if you take a look here, this is an inline six cylinder engine for those of you that may not be familiar, and it has six separate ignition coils, one for each cylinder. Now the significance of this system is, I'll call it a two wire cop system, even though there's three wires here. One is just an outside ground reference, and the first wire will supply voltage on each one of these coils. The second wire is actually the control for the ground side of the ignition coil primary circuit. The PCM is in direct control of that circuit, and this provides access, uh, a, a view of in-cylinder uh, combustion occurring through the eyes of the ignition scope functions of our lab scope. We're going to use that portion of that circuit to gain some diagnostic direction on what's going on with this ignition system in its entirety. So we stepped away from the vehicle for a while to develop a diagnostic game plan. I like to curtail my diagnostic approach around the vehicle I'm working on. Many vehicles, a lot of the components I'm interested in seeing are very easy to access on paper. But in reality, when you're underneath the hood or underneath the dashboard, trying to gain access to these circuits, it's very difficult to do. So I'm always on the side of trying to gain as much information as I can in one shot without investing too much time or energy. So in this case here, if you follow me over to the vehicle, we found that these ignition coils are supplied voltage by one common source here. And if you could see here, if I move my hand and put my flashlight in the way here, you'll see a splice pack here. This heavy wire here, this heavier gauge wire, is a voltage source that supplies all six of my ignition coils with voltage supply. They meet right here inside this splice pack where these little wires branch off to each individual coil. This provides what I call the low-hanging fruit, the information we need to make some diagnostic decisions without investing too much time. We're going to interface our amp probe to this heavy gauge wire here and gather all the current flowing through each ignition coil in turn, all in one location. So I'm going to turn my amp probe on now. I'm going to interface it to that heavy gauge wire we talked about. Again, we researched the wiring diagrams. It's very important you do that. Never guess. It's not worth the, uh, the mistake. We're going to zero my probe, and we're going to move on to the lab scope. Okay. So we've already hooked up our amp probe to our common voltage supply wire for all six ignition coils. Let's set up our lab scope here to capture the data inside the buffer of this eScope Elite 4, and we can go back and view it to see if we can see anything suspect about the circuits. So the first thing I'm going to do is go in here to channel 1. I'm going to set it up to capture data using an amp probe at a 1 millivolt to 100 milliamp ratio. I'm going to go into my deep record function. This will allow me to start filling my buffer with data. I'll be back in a moment because I have to go start this BMW. That was a long walk. So I'm going to stop recording data. As you can see, our buffer has captured some uh, amperage data through the ignition coils. I'm going to zoom in upon this data, see if we can get a better look at what's going on here. So I'm just going to take a little nibble here. And what we can see here right away is a repetitive pattern occurring. 
We've got all six ignition coil ramps captured at one time, and the process repeats itself for every engine cycle. And in each engine cycle, we'd see about every sixth ignition coil ramp is a ramp that's significantly lower than the rest. We're going to have to zoom in for a better look here. And it's evident that this fold is happening over and over again as we pan our way through this capture. We're going to have to attach a second channel to get a better look at what's going on and we can identify which cylinder is at fault. So we've done some diligence here. We've stepped away from the vehicle to do some more research. We had to find out what the firing order is for this BMW, and it turns out to be 153624. Now that's all well and good, but we still have to determine which coil is at fault. So to do that, we're going to have to attach this probe here to a specific coil, any one of the six will do, and we're going to use that as a form of synchronization for a lap scope here. By having access to a specific ignition coil, we can simply count our way from this probe from this reference point, our, our uh, sync point, to the suspect coil ramp to determine which one's at fault because we wrap that around the firing order here. So if you follow me over to the core, I'm going to take my Pierce probe here and attach it to the control circuit on coil, ignition coil number one. It looks like this white wire here. But while I'm down here, I also told you I wanted to show you some significant characteristic that this, bo this scope boasts. If you follow me over here to dual scope mode, you can see these channels highlighted in red here. This scope outputs a negative voltage bias on each one of the four traces in this case <clears throat> to help determine circuit integrity. What I mean by that is this. If I take my Pierce probe and I connect it to the circuit and I have reference to ground, this box is going to turn gray. So when you have a loose connection where a scope lead is not properly connected to a specific circuit on a vehicle, the difference between what you see on a lab scope due to a poor capture versus an actual fault uh, can be confusing. So if you watch, when I connect my, my probe here to this circuit, you're going to see this box turn gray. If you reference channel number two there, when it's connected, on, off, on, off. So on, this tells me I have a good, a good connection to my circuit here. I'm then going to set up channel number two. If you follow me over here, you can see 500 volts on the screen. Yes, this scope has the ability to capture 500 volts without doing any damage to the internal circuitry or the board on a lab scope. It's safe to handle that. This scope was built to be used for automotive applications and ignition coil being a step up transformer can easily produce primary voltages close to 500 volts. Sometimes it saves time not having to grab other devices, auxiliary devices like attenuators to step down voltage so we don't hurt a scope. That's one of the characteristics I like about this scope. So we're going to start our capture again, turning on channel 2 this time as well. We're going to start our buffer. I'm going to start the vehicle and come back after a few seconds again. So those of you that are new to lab scopes, I'm, I'm showing you a, a, a direct, almost like you're sitting on my shoulder while I'm diagnosing this vehicle. You guys need to be getting comfortable with lab scope diagnostics because it's, it's needed nowadays to, to make it through our day accurately. So we're going to pursue this fault the same way we did prior, except this time we have the second channel that we're using for sync. I'm going to pan a little bit to put this in the center of my screen. It's just the way I prefer to view it. I'm going to open up my zoom window here and just take a bite of data here. and we can see an ignition event occurring every six coil ramp which makes sense because this is a six cylinder engine our red trace is the ignition coil primary drive wire for ignition coil number one I'm going to zoom in on this yellow trace that's what I'm concerned with the red trace just tells me where number one starts so if I zoom tighter here and I'm going to turn off the red trace for a moment we can see one two three four five six one every six ignition coil current ramp is significantly lower. We knew that from the first capture. But by adding our second trace here, we know as reference to number one, 
the control for ignition coil number one lines up with the poor coil ramp. So we can see here clearly if I turn off my, my sink trace where our poor coil ramp lays. I'm going to plot some cursors here to show the difference in amperage flow through what I would call the properly operating coils and our suspect coil. Our properly operating coils are flowing about 12 amps of current where our poorly or suspect coil is only flowing just under 7 amps of current. We have to pursue the fault further. So if you think about it here, we've got one of six coils that is not operating properly. I want to ask you a question. If I asked you to run a marathon but I told you you weren't allowed to sleep beforehand for 10 hours, you have nothing to eat and nothing to drink, how well are you going to perform? Not too good. So we can't expect any electrical device to operate properly unless it has everything it needs to perform properly. What am I getting at? Yes, it's very clear we have a one out of six coils that's not performing well. The likely fault is the coil itself is probably bad. But a coil can't perform well if it doesn't have proper voltage feed and good ground control and reference to ground. We have to pursue those first before we condemn any coil. So rather than playing swaptronics and moving coil from side to side, Let's apply some science, use some logic, and maybe learn something about voltage drop, current flow, Ohm's law, and see if we can move further from there. So what we've already determined through the previous captures that cylinder number one ignition coil is suspected as being faulty. To prove it out further, we have to verify that the coil has proper ignition voltage, proper control to ground, and a good ground reference. To do that, we're going to have to verify the supply is available to our coil. I'm going to do that with this back probe here. I'm going to attach it to my scope lead. Verify ignition voltage references available here at this ignition coil as well as ground control and reference to ground. I'm going to go start the vehicle and start filling our buffer again. So our buffer is full and I know it appears there's no data from the red channel or the green channel. That's just because I have the channels turned off. You can turn them on and off at will at any given point in time. They're already captured in the buffer. So what I'm going to do here is zoom in just as we did before. Again, this is just me being picky. I like to put my waveform in the middle of the screen. I'm going to zoom and grab a little bit of data. You see the process repeating over and over again just as we did before. I'm going to turn off the red trace so we can see our ignition coil current ramps. We can see there's our faulty one. Red trace is for cylinder number one. Now we're going to look at our voltage supply. We can see first of all that our red trace is coming very close to ground here. about 700 millivolts when it's loaded. So we're awfully close to ground, which indicates we don't likely have a ground fault here. But if I zoom back out and reset, zoom in again, and look at our voltage trace here, we can see significant, significantly voltage is dropping on our voltage supply wire to our coil. And when is it dropping? every time ignition one coil fires. You can see that through the eyes of the amperage trace and through the eyes of the voltage primary control wire. If I zoom tighter here and apply some cursors when the good coils fire voltage only pulls down to about 11 volts. However when our suspect coil circuit fires Voltage drops way down to about six and a half volts. That is not adequate voltage supply. So our coil, regardless of how many coils we put on this vehicle, nothing's going to fix the problem until any coil that goes in cylinder number one has adequate voltage supply. We need good voltage supply and good ground control and reference to ground to make these coils work properly. So at this point, it's safe to say that we've got a voltage supply issue to ignition coil number one. Now I've been wrong before. So rather than approach my service advisor in this case and tell him I have to start digging somewhere further into this car like perhaps a wire harness or a connection underneath a fuse block, I want to prove my case in point first. I'm going to take this fuse jumper wire 
that I got here from AES Wave. Um, their terminal kit, it's phenomenal, has a lot of options, configurations we can build that we can jumper voltage safely to this circuit without doing any damage. Again, the key is a fuse here. So we're going to attach our wire to a voltage source. There's a port here perfect for jump starting a vehicle. And we're going to attack, again, this fuse supply of voltage to our voltage supply circuit on ignition coil number one. I want to do this dynamically here. So we're going to have the car running. We're going to have the scope running. I'm going to supply voltage while the car is running and then take voltage away so you can see the, the voltage change, the voltage drop change as we're operating this vehicle. So I apologize for the noise. We have to run this vehicle so I can demonstrate my case in point. Here's my fuse jumper wire. If you make your way over to the scope, we can see here the scope's running. Now the resolution doesn't look that good because we're zoomed way out. I've got a lot of sweep on the screen for, for value, upwards of 300. 12 volts is somewhere in there. So what I'm going to do is jumper voltage. I want to show you something else here. If you see this purple tab here, this allows me to put a strike on my screen when I choose to. This way, when I go back and research my data, I'm not trying to hunt through data, I'm trying to find my strike here. I'll explain to you in a moment. So, I'm going to take my supply voltage, I'm going to bypass the wire harness by taking that 12 volt supply to the ignition coil. I'm going to come over here and tap this, and then I'm going to come back here and remove this splice, and tap this again. And then I'm going to stop my recording. I'm going to go shut the vehicle off and then we can analyze this data together. So now that our buffer is filled with data, if you take a look over here to the right side of the screen, you see these two purple strikes here. This is where I told the scope screen that I wanted to make a significant strike. This gives me like a buoy, like a dropping anchor from a ship. Instead of going back and analyzing seconds and seconds and seconds of data very closely, I can simply look for the strikes and know that's where I made the change I wanted to. Again, another feature ATS posts that not many other scopes do. So I'm going to zoom in on this area of interest here. And we can see here, the voltage, let me zoom even tighter. The voltage goes from 14 volts here, and every time an ignition coil, oops, every time ignition coil number one strikes, voltage drops down. Right here is where I jumped a clean source of voltage. We bypassed the harness and we can see those voltage drops no longer occur. So through the use of access to good service information, the applicable knowledge we've attained from years of practice and using appropriate tools the right way, we were able to determine not only the source of an ignition fault, but we were able to pinpoint it to a specific circuit, a specific coil, and also prove that the coil wasn't working properly because it wasn't being supplied everything it needed, like voltage supply, reference to ground, and good control. We've proven out good control, we've proven out good reference to ground, and we also proved that it was a poor voltage supply, which caused poor performance of the ignition coil. Now this isn't a repair video. We're not going to show you where we went about finding our, our voltage drop. That's not what this is about. It's about learning these techniques and applying to the vehicles in your work bay so you can fix cars properly the first time in a relatively short amount of time with little energy invested. I want to thank everybody again for tuning in. I'm Brandon Stecker with Trained by Techs. Uh, if you have any questions regarding the testing we performed today, the tools we used today, where we went about purchasing the tools, or even finding access to suitable training in your area, please find us on Facebook or on YouTube or at our website, trainedbytechs.com.